2001, right here in Cincinnati, Ohio, protests and uprising against police brutality. Stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. Protect the Dreamers. Stop the deportations. Justice for Trayvon Martin. Ferguson. Justice for Mike Brown. Justice for Tamir Rice. Justice for Sam DeBose right here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Minneapolis this year, justice for George Floyd. Louisville, justice for Breonna Taylor. Cincinnati, right here today, this a few nights ago, justice for George Floyd. When an individual is protesting society's refusal to acknowledge his dignity as a human being, his very act of protest confers dignity on him, Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin, for those who don't know, was one of the leading organizers and strategists behind the March on Washington in 1963. One of the reasons I wanna elevate this quote and I elevated those examples of protests is to elevate that protest, as you all know, is something that has been used as a legitimate and useful form of social change in our society for a very long time. Protests have been used by nearly every group of people. In fact, the founding of our nation um, happened as protests were occurring, right? And so protest is a part of the legacy and history of what it means to bring about social change and social justice here in the United States of America. And so I elevate that because I don't want anything I share this evening to be perceived as saying protests aren't important. Protests are essential. In fact, I am protesting, right? Um, I have been out there on the front lines like many of you. And so protests are a legitimate and useful means of social change. But what's also important to realize as we're thinking about organ and organizing protests throughout this country and really throughout the world, right? We're seeing protests are sparking up everywhere from um, London to New Zealand, right? It looked as though the entire country of New Zealand came out for the protests from the pictures I saw, right? Protests are rising in Ghana, protests are rising in Toronto and Brazil. Everywhere in the world, people are rising up and saying enough is enough about the killing of Black people at the arms of, of those who have been given power with the supposed job to protect and serve. And this is happening not just here in Ohio, here in Minneapolis, here in these United States. Brut brutality against Black people at the hands of police has been happening all over the world. Right. And so protests is often a way that we express our anger, express um, our, our righteous indignation at what is happening in our society, express our grief, right, at all the things that is happening in society. Protest is a legitimate and useful means of bringing about social change. But what's important to understand is that protests, like all forms of direct action, should connect to a larger strategy. Oftentimes, because of the, the statement that protests make, um, we focus on the protests when we look back at history and movements that have occurred. We focus on the March on Washington. We focus on the march across the, the, the bridge in uh, um, Selma, right? We focus on those things, and oftentimes we don't teach people about the larger strategy that those acts, those direct acts in the form of protests were connected to. And so today I want to talk a little bit about that, how you can do, how you can connect the direct action of the protest that you are a part of and helping to coordinate and lead to a larger strategy. And then I also want to think about and talk through ways that you can um, ensure that the protests that you planned are planned strategically. 
I say this under the backdrop of the reality that uh, similar to what happened in 2014 in Ferguson, um, protests today are almost like emerging out of the ground. Um, it's not even always clear where they're coming from, right? People are showing up without anyone having to text or call them because they are outraged and they should be, we should be. And so this is in no way um, a statement to say that we are not doing what we need to do, right? These, these protests that are emerging that I myself am participating in are vital. And so what I think is important as we, as we have this conversation this evening is that we also think about, okay, these protests are emerging. We're in day nine of protests across this country. How do we start to be intentional and take a step back and connect this to larger strategy if it has not been? In some places it is, right? And how can we be as strategic as possible when planning it? So the first thing I wanna elevate is that protest is a tactic. Um, here's a quote by Whitney Young. It says, you can holler, protest, march, picket, and demonstrate, but somebody must be willing to sit in on the strategy conferences and plot a course, end quote. Right, protest is a, is a tactic. It's not a strategy, it's a tactic. Protests are a means to an end. Connected to protests, you should have vision. There should be strategy and goals. And then there should also be consideration of what other tactics to use. And so by vision, I mean, what is the world that you hope to create? Um, one of the, the most profound examples of this goes back to actually a vision shared at a, oh, at a protest with the March on Washington. People quote Martin Luther King Jr., right, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. so often with the, the, the speech that he gave where he declared the dreams and visions that he has for America. Right, and so vision is important and vision connects to and should show up in the protest, right? So what is the world you hope to create? What's important about this beyond just being able to articulate that and to, to connect with people in that is having a clear vision assures that you are fighting for something and not just fighting against something. I can tell you as, a, as an activist, it is exhausting fighting against injustice. It is much more empowering, still exhausting at times, but much more empowering to know that you are fighting for something. There's, there's a shift that happens when you're approaching a challenge with a clear vision of the world you're working to bring and not just what you're opposed to, right? And so I wanna encourage us as we're thinking about how we use protests in this time and how we catapult from protests to larger movement, how we are connecting our protest to the vision of the world we hope to create. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then there's the strategies, our goals. That's the roadmap and the milestones to achieving your vision. When you have your vision, you can start to think of what are the what is the change that you want to see happen that helps culminate us toward that vision. What are the goals and milestones that, that lead along that roadmap that lead us to that vision? And then finally, that brings you to tactics that you can utilize, right? The direct and indirect actions that you can, that can help you accomplish your strategic goals. And so I wanna talk a little bit more about vision for a moment. It's important as we're thinking about this to use our vision to define the change you wanna see in the world, the change you want to bring about. Your vision should include and inspire others. I go back to that I have a dream speech, right? That speech, it, it fired people up and inspired people. Everyone could see themselves represented in that. It was broad, but it was clear. A clear vision also helps you to stay focused on what you're building and makes it easier to minimize the noise. There's so much. For those of you who are newer to the activism world, um, you'll soon experience people pulling you in different directions and saying, no, what really matters is this. What you should focus on is this. You know, spend your time here instead. Having a clear vision allows you to, to be able to screen those requests and know when is this thing actually helping us move toward the vision and when is it not? It allows you to minimize the noise so you can act with discernment so that you don't get wrapped up in the noise of what, what people are saying to do, you're able to stay clear and, and have decisiveness in your actions. Some considerations to think about 
as you're thinking about what your vision is, if you have not already developed a vision, you know, we're not often told when we, when we jump into social justice work, we're not often told to stop and take a moment and dream. But dream, what is your dream for the city, for the nation, for the world, right? And, and especially in this moment when we're talking about police brutality and how it impacts Black people here and all over the world, right? We're talking about the dehumanization of Black people that goes back to our Constitution. What, how do we dream what could be in place of that so that we can work toward that? And then it's important as you're thinking about your vision to ask yourself, what type of world does others want to create? Particularly with this, what type of world do those who are being impacted negatively the most want to create? So in this case, asking yourself and talking to Black people if you are not Black and saying, what is the world that you want? What is the change that you want to see? But also having an idea yourself and saying, here's what I'm thinking. What are your thoughts on that? Is, will this actually be useful for you, right? And allowing their voices to, to drive that vision. People want to feel included in your vision. And then there's building out the strategy, right? So strategizing how you plan to bring your vision about. And so a good strategy is going to have a balance between practical changes that can occur now and stretch goals, right? More long-term um, structural changes that's going to require sustained work. You know, good strategy has a balance between those things. What's important to elevate out of this is that oftentimes those immediate goals can oftentimes become your current demands during protests, right? And so protesting and airing our frustrations and our griefs is super important and we need space for that. You know, as a Black mother, this is always on my mind. As someone who values healing spaces, um, this is always on my mind. How do we create space for people to air their transgressions and process their grief, right? And so there needs to be space for that. But then how do we connect that to demands of what we're trying to ask folks to do? What are we wanting to happen right now to right the immediate most pressing wrong? And then those stretch goals, those more structural changes become part of your larger strategy, your larger plan. And so then that brings us to tactics. When you know your vision and you have a clear vision and you're, you've thought through what your strategy is, then you can find ways that your protest um, fits into that, right? And protest becomes one of many possible change tactics. And so protests can achieve important goals for social justice movements, such as elevating issues, showing solidarity and pursuing pressuring elected officials, right? And so a lot of what we've seen happen today in these last 10 days is that protest has elevated the issue of police brutality against black and brown people in this country and around the world. And in doing so, it has pressured um, those in positions of power to actually do something about the most pressing issue, right? And so to be clear, um, the reason that charges have been brought against those officers is because of protests and the pressure, the constant pressure, right? And we're going to have to keep that constant pressure and continue to elevate this, this issue so that the press doesn't start reporting on other things tomorrow. We're going to have to keep elevating this issue and putting pressure on them to, to stay focused on this and say that we are not falling asleep this time, right? This is not over. This is important to us. We have to elevate that. We have to show solidarity with the people in Minneapolis, the people in Louisville, right? The people all over the world. Um, who are being impacted by this issue. And we have to pressure elected officials. It's because Minneapolis was burning that they brought those officers in, not because of nice conversations. So protest serves a lot of purposes, you know, and they can, uh, they can put a lot of pressure on elected officials. The FBI is looking into the case of Breonna Taylor, not because people sat in a room and, and said, FBI have a change of heart. They're doing that because People in Louisville erupted, right? And so protests serve a lot of points and sometimes merely elevating the issue and showing solidarity does it, right? And it, and it puts that pressure on elected officials. 
What's important to think about in addition to that though, is that when you know your goal, you can actually maximize the impact of your protest. And you can start to consider ways that you can pair your protests with other tactics, right? And so protests in and of themselves elevate issues. But when you are able to drive, when you know what your demand is and you know your goal, you can be even more effective by channeling your energy and the energy of that group of the people who show up to the right targets. And so I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. Before I shift, I wanna share this, that leadership source matters. Um, in the movement to create an equitable and just world for black people, which is the focus of why we're bringing people together all over the world while people are showing up. Right now it's about creating an equitable and just world for black people. The vision strategy and tactics should be led by and are coordinated with black people. That is not to say that if you are not black, you don't have a role in leadership. It is simply to say that if you are trying to lead a movement to bring about equity and justice for black people, and there are not black people at the table helping to think about what the vision is for the world, what the strategy is and what tactics to use, then you are missing the mark. You are missing the mark. And so I just, it's important for me to say that to you all. Um, that leadership source matters, um, that Black people should be helping to drive this vision, strategy, and tactics. And that goes for whatever the movement is, right? So whatever the, the anti-colonization movement, Indigenous First people should be leading the narrative around that movement, the vision, the strategy, and we should be working with them, right? Not, not trying to take their place, not, not silencing them by thinking that we know better than what they know for what they need for their communities. And so this is important. And I wanna make sure that as you're thinking strategically about how to connect these protests that are erupting in your, your area to larger strategy, do so in relationship with black people. And so as you think about the big picture, how do you then, I wanna zoom in now to, to the direct um, um, immediate action, right? Of how do you organize your protest strategically? And I have a quote here. Every successful social movement in this country's history has used disruption as a strategy to fight for social change. Alicia Garva. Every successful social movement in this country's history has used disruption as a strategy for fight to fight for social change. That quote is, is, is very pressing. Um, and, and important, uh, especially as you think about engaging in acts of civil disobedience and what does it look like to disrupt people's everyday movement and way of life as a way of making a statement that you don't get to go about your day normally while people are dying and being brutalized. And so what I want to elevate here, and I, I'm gonna wrap up soon after this portion, um, uh, this is very much a high level. I wanna make sure we have some time for, for conversation and Q&A. Um, if you have questions, please drop them in the comment box. Um, we have a host, uh, Abby from Xavier University, um, who is going to be screening those and, and answering those questions, asking those questions out loud. Um, and I'll be answering those questions or inviting others to if there's questions I don't know the answers to, right? Because I don't know everything. Um, but uh, so please put your questions in there. But what I want to elevate for this is just thinking about organizing your next protest, how to make each protest count. It's important to know your demands, so the immediate changes you desire, your targets, the entities or individuals you seek to influence, and have a call to action, actions you want protesters to take today and then later, right? What is that follow-up way to engage them? Um, your demands are usually the immediate and short-term changes you want to occur. So when you think back to the, the strategy that I was talking about and building out your strategy, the reason I started with the big picture first is because if you know your vision and your strategy, you get your demands. It become clear what your demands are because you know your change points. Um, so your demands are usually, not always, but usually the, the immediate and short-term changes you want to occur. And so that for this, that might be the arrest and now the charging right, the, the indictment and the, the, uh, the chart sentencing, right, of those officers um, in all of the cities, right? And so asking yourself what outcome or objective you wanna bring about. 
And when exploring this question, it's important to note that this may lead you to think about other tactics beyond protests. What does it look like to have valid initiatives to change policies? What does it look like to have initiatives that um, are canvassing and, and, and involving more people into the movement? What does it look like to have tactics that are legal measures, right? Working with, with lawyers, civil rights um, lawyers who are able to help you build a legal case for change, right? If you can't take a legislative approach to it. And so oftentimes when you're clear on your demands, it becomes easier for you to think about what are other tactics, tactics that you can utilize. And so it's important to say, do your research. Um, every city across this world, especially when it comes to police brutality against Black people, there are folks who have been in that city working on that issue for decades and may already have well thought out demands. This is important because it saves you time. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, um, people are busy. You're trying to manage all the things that you're going to learn about in the other trainings after this session around how to marshal, how do you, you know, marshal and keep safety? How do you help people who need medical attention? What does it look like to have legal observation on the ground, right? You're managing all these things. So if you can, if you can have demands that are already preconceived by people who have done the research, have the relationships and know how to engage in the space, this makes your job tremendously easier. For those of you who are tuning in here in Cincinnati, Ohio, you know, if you think back to the, the, the riots and the uprising that occurred in 2001 after the death of Timothy Thomas and, and so many others, that was like the end of a, a long list, right, of police killings of Black males in this city. You know, um, out, out of that came a collaborative agreement that the Black United Front worked with the ACLU of Ohio to create. And so I elevate that because if you are organizing around this for the first time here in Cincinnati, there are already demands because we are in the 20 year refresh process for that. And so do, reach out to folks at the Black United Front, Iris Rowley, Reverend um, Damon Lynch, um, and, and other folks who are leading that work here in Cincinnati um, to, to learn more about the demands that they are elevating out of that and what you can do to plug into the work that's already happening. You know, and other cities may also have similar things already in place if you're tuning in from, from other places. And so these demands, and in, in, in that refresh, you'll see, if you look into it, you'll notice that those demands are both immediate and short and learn long term because we've been at this for decades. And so your demands are usually the short term and immediate. You know, there's the call for arrest and charging, right? And there's also the long term structural change connected to that. And then it's important to be strategic about the target. The target is the person or in organization that can influence or follow through on your demands, who can actually bring about your demands. So depending on what your demands are, you'll, you'll be able to do research to figure out what are the leverage points for change and where who has influence over those leverage points. And it can help you to know how to structure your protests and how to utilize and bring in other tactics. It helps you in the, in the sense of planning your protest, knowing your target will help you to identify the best location and time, the, um, time of day to have your protest, to have the maximum impact. It'll also help you to think strategically about your message and your speakers. So this is going beyond um, thinking about what chance to use, but this is also thinking about you know, what is the message? How do you wanna convey your, your vision? How do you wanna convey your demands? to folks and things like that. Importantly, especially around the issue of policing, there might be multiple targets. I know here in Cincinnati, you know, we have we have targets when it comes to the, the police, police chief, we have targets of prosecutors, right? Charges of judicial system, you know, we have charges, uh, targets that have to do with our mayor and how the mayor is weaponizing the Metro and mass transit system as a tool, as a weapon for the police to, to brutalize protesters, right? So there's multiple targets and that's okay. That allows you to, to mix up where you're doing your rallies. And if you're doing marches in between those rallies, you can plan to start a rally in one place and march to those different locations. And if you're strategic, you're timing your protests at a time when the people you need to hear your message is in their offices to hear your message or you're doing it in a place where you can show up and disrupt their meeting, right? Disrupt what they're doing. Even a silent protest is disruptive. You don't actually have to speak to disrupt. 
You can literally show up in masses at City Hall silently, and that will disrupt what is happening. You know, and so you can be strategic about planning when and where you plan your protests and how you structure your protests if you are clear on the target. And you need to know your demands and have a strategy and a vision in order to know your target. And then finally, it's important to engage those who show up. And so this means thinking beyond what chance to use in your march or rally. It means thinking about what other action you're calling them to take. You know, in this case, there are petitions circulating with the uh, colorofchange.org um, calling for justice. Those petitions could have been circulated at the rallies, right? Um, are you going to invite people to do a larger strategy? And now you're like, you know what? This isn't just about police and this is about economics. This is about displacement and housing. And we want to have people canvas neighborhoods that are most impacted by that and here elevate those voices. So maybe you want to help have people uh, sign up to help you canvas. Maybe you want people to call their officials. We can do a mass calling to our prosecutor here, calling on our prosecutor to, to make a statement about what the prosecutor there should be doing, right? So calling officials here are there, right? And so thinking about ways to engage those who show up beyond the moment and in that moment. And so consider pairing your protests with other tactics. You know, don't lose out on the opportunity when you may have thousands of people there who have not come out before to ask to invite them into something else. And when possible, asking people just to sign up to volunteer, even if you haven't yet figured out what you're going to ask them to do to volunteer, ask them to sign up to volunteer and that's getting their information and folks who are willing. And then you can think about it later if you have to. Sometimes these things are emerging so quickly, we don't always have time to plan that deep, right? And that's okay but remembering to have a table where people can sign up to volunteer and engage in the movement on a larger level. And then you can say, you know, send out a follow-up email or text blast and say, you know, support the bail fund, donate to the bail fund, show up here for the next rally or march, right? Ways to stay in communication and to engage them farther after that immediate act. And so I want to share this quote before I close out and say, um, and by James Baldwin, someone who I absolutely adore. I love America more than any country in the world and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. I just want to remind us as I close out here, I know I went through that really quick. We started late and I don't want to hold you all too late, um, but, uh, and this will be recorded and shared, so don't worry. But I, I lift up this quote because oftentimes people will tell you that because you are protesting, you don't love this country. Or because you are protesting, you are anti-America. Or in this case, of protesting for Black lives, you're anti-white. Don't worry about that. That's the noise that I was referring to that you don't need to worry about. It is precisely because you believe in and love this country that you have a right to criticize it and to demand better for our communities. And so carry that with you in all that you do. And so these are the two main points I want you to remember as you walk away. That protests are legitimate, but like all forms of direct action, you should try at all costs possible to, to, to connect those direct actions to a larger strategy. And protests should be planned strategically when possible. So make the most out of each protest. At this time, I want to open it up for any questions. Robin, you have lots of questions, and I'm not sure we'll be able to get to them all. But since you ended with strategy, I will start with um, someone asked about when you get to that point when you've already got your vision and strategy, how do you find others who are in alignment with that work in order to do more work collaboratively? That is a great question. So that is part of why sharing your vision is so important. Having a way that you share your vision, um, every protest you show up to, every meeting you show up to, share your vision with others. Um, and if you, if you create your vision in a way that includes other people, then it'll be easy for them to see themselves as connected to your vision. Right? Um, and so sharing your vision with others and showing up to others' events 
in others' meetings, right, and the things that folks in the, in the community are doing and hearing their vision and allowing what you hear from them to, to help you deepen your analysis of your own vision, right? And so being willing to morph and change your vision in a way that doesn't jeopardize your morality, right? Um, as long as it's not jeopardizing your morality, being open to other people's perspectives so that your vision becomes a collective vision um, that everyone can see themselves connected to. So one, uh, there are a few questions that connect to that challenge of once you take a vision to a group, right? Like your narrative starts to live outside of you and you can't always control it. So I'm gonna throw out a couple of these questions all together and just let you talk about which part of it is most compelling for you. Um, so the first is sometimes it protests, um, as you described organically, something might de-escalate and might not quite match the vision. And so are there any tips or tricks you would offer for helping sort of realign in the moment um, sort of that public narrative or vision that is original to the event that you are organizing. Really specifically about that, somebody asked, how do we ensure that vision, strategies, and voices defined by the Black community are not drowned out by signs from the non-Black community? And then last, I'll just throw in there the challenge of the media and where reporting on um, an event might change some of the narrative. So I'm just going to put all of those tensions out there and let you talk about them in the way, and feel free to come back to me for reminding you what I threw into the bucket. Yeah, I was trying to write it down as well. So uh, a few thoughts that come to mind. Um, one of the things that is just a truth, especially when we're in this moment where things are just emerging so organically, um, is that uh, we can't control every message that comes out. This is messy. This is messy. You have old guard organizers who have been at this for a long time, right? Who's like, I've been doing this. Where y'all been at, right? <laughs> Some of y'all like, yes, I think about that all the time, right? I see your faces. <laughs> but you know, you have those folks who are like, I've been doing this, right? Um, and they have a vision. They're like, this is what we need. It's easy. We know what we need. We just need it too, right? And then you have those new emergent leaders who are like, wow. I, I always felt passionate about this, but this moment moved me to act in a way that other moments didn't, right? And they're gonna come with their own agenda and we can't control everything. All you can do is be consistent and clear in, your, in what you do and say. And so one of the things that um, we, I used to do when doing uh, diversity trainings that uh, I think is useful in the protest world as well is um, be sure and clear about who has the opening statement and who has the closing statement. People most are most likely to remember the last thing they heard. And so if you are organizing a protest and someone comes up rogue with a microphone and says something, that's fine. You know, people have a right to free speech, but make sure you have the last message. So the last thing that people hear is what you want them to hear. That's what they remember. Um, so that's that's something I would suggest. I would also suggest, you know, a tool, a tactic from um, actually uh, the mental health space um, that uh, uh, one of my uh, friends taught me around working with um, adolescents um, with emotional uh, challenges, um, a practice called Reflect, Honor, Connect. Right. And so when folks are sharing their messages, you know, I do this with everybody in my life. It's actually transformative. I suggest doing this in general. But one way um, people want to feel seen, heard um, and, and, and acknowledged. Right. And so when people are standing up and they're sharing their messages, being willing to say, like, thank you. Like that was a powerful message, you know, and, and, and honor what they're saying while then redirecting the message to what you want it to be, right? That is a way to, to do so in a way that people don't feel like you shut them down or told them that what they believe or what they feel don't matter. My line for that is if you are dehumanizing other people, then I just don't, I don't have patience for it. That's when I'm like, okay, yeah, we're not about that life. I'm going to go ahead and interrupt. But short of that, if it's just a, a disagreement of an approach, then they let, their, let them have their, their perspective. Um, the last thing I'll say in terms of elevating Black voices, um, if Black people are at the table with you organizing your action um, and they are on the list of speakers, then um, it, no one cares what the signs are. Like, you can't control all the stuff. Like, I think if you concern yourself with every single detail that people who show up do, you're going to stress yourself out. 
You know, all you can do is make sure that at every turn you are organizing and strategizing with Black people, elevating their voices in, in the actual protests and actions, um, allowing them to leave that space. And if people have signs that are ridiculous and, you know, you can't really do anything about it. And so that's what I would consider noise, right? Um, and so not, not concerning yourself with the noise. So Robin, in order to honor our time and allow folks to get to the next session and to give you the exact last word, I will say <laughs> I've selected some of the questions so that if there's spaces, um, folks, we will send out via the registration, the recordings, but also some resources. And so questions about some resources or tips, I will pass along to Robin so that if there's a way to offer that in a written form, easily we can do that. But we want to give you the last word so that if there's one thing we remember that we leave with that. Yeah, so this is emerging. You know, things are erupting and emerging out of the ground. Um, staying focused and knowing your vision and knowing what you are working to build will allow you to sustain in a movement in a way that working against and just fighting against the system of white supremacy will exhaust you and will make it hard to sustain. And so being clear about your vision, not getting distracted by the noise and centering your work on elevating the leadership and voices of Black people um, so that you are strategic in your work is essential to, to connecting your protests to the, and direct actions to strategy. Um, and so thank you all so much.